Now, in Edinburgh, we have made some identifiable steps in the, that direction. The film that I'm going to show now is uh, reasonably described, I think, as the Edinburgh research purpose, versatile uh, assembly robot, uh, locally described as uh, Freddy. That is Pat Ambler on the left, Rod Burstall, who supervised this work in the last years, putting a heap of parts on the platform. Uh, this is the beginning of the execution phase of the program. The previous teaching phase, which occupied altogether two days, uh, isn't shown here. And the parts can be dumped at random and have been. And in fact, an extra part, which doesn't belong to that assembly kit at all, but belongs to a ship assembly kit, uh, this one has been thrown in for good measure. That is the oblique camera uh, that uh, is responsible for uh, building up an internal model of the overview of the whole platform. When it comes to detailed examination, the overhead camera is used as here. In a moment, that outline will be replaced by an approximation in terms of line segments, and there are elaborate data structures in the machine memory, which is a large part of the research interest, uh, which form uh, compact and convenient uh, descriptions of the messy images seen by the television camera. Having identified that as a car body, it's being uh, picked up and put in the assembly station in a stereotyped position, ready for the second phase of the program, which we'll see uh, later, and which has less of interest in it from an artificial intelligence point of view. But the points of interest in this first part of the program are to do with constructing internal descriptions of messy and complex external phenomena, um, including, for example, uh, jumbled heaps of that sort, as the basis for identification where possible and where not possible appropriate action. In the case of a heap, uh, there's a whole uh, repertoire of strategies available, of which the first will be to attempt to identify a, protru a protuberant part. Uh, and then an attempt will uh, be made to pick it up. These are potential uh, hand positions. There's a little bit of internal planning going on to try and find positions for placing the two hands which will be suitable for grabbing that protuberant part without fouling any of the other um, objects. And now having selected a pair of positions, um, we're doing a pickup. The system will now look around the platform. That little twitch was to shake off anything which might have uh, been associated, picked up by mistake with the, with the rest. <coughs> Having found an empty place that's being put down, it will now be examined by the overhead camera. A caricature, a simple description made. Um, and uh, this will be matched through what the computer memory holds in the way of descriptions and identified as a wheel, hopefully, and then picked up and put in a suitable place uh, preparatory for the final assembly. We're now, uh, we've jumped a bit and we're now nearing the end of this part of the program. This is the last wheel to be identified and now all the parts are laid out and the second part uh, is just about to begin. The second part perhaps looks a little smoother. It's very much less interesting. Um, it's done blind, no use of vision at all. Uh, quite considerable use of touch. Uh, for this purpose, the system has a primitive workbench, and that's a little vice. It's about to close the, the jaw on the wheel in order to clamp it in a more or less standard position. The only really high-level routines available as commands to the uh, programmer in instructing the put, putting together part are um, two, which we'll see illustrated in a moment. These little feeling operations are simply updating its internal model to correct the dead reckoning. Um, in fitting the axle into the hole, uh, one of the high-level routines was used, a spiral search in which it goes around in a widening spiral, uh, prodding, and when it meets no resistance, uh, pushes it home. The next uh, operation is to insert the axle into one of the holes through the car body. And this is spiral search again, which has been successful. 
The difference between the two parts of the program, the second part is con uh, fairly conventional uh, programming, simply taking advantage perhaps of a reasonably uh, various and well-documented library of robot support software. But the difference between that and the earlier part, the vision and, lay and the layout, can be illustrated by the effects of interference. If things go wrong during the assembly phase, the one that I'm saying is far the less intelligent of the two, insofar as that word should be introduced at all, uh, if you, at this stage, were to knock the partially completed assembly onto the floor, uh, the program would never recover from it. But if you do things like that in the earlier stage, it has a sufficiently elaborate model of its world and a sufficiently broad repertoire of strategies in general to be able to um, recover and push the job through to completion. So in that sense, one derives a valuable degree of robustness from the employment of some of these techniques. Well, this is the final <laughs> assembly test. Since then, uh, a slightly more advanced tour de force has been attempted and in fact succeeded, which was to teach the system to approach a jumbled part, uh, a jumbled heap consisting both of car parts and ship parts, completely mixed up, and successfully disentangle them, identify them, and construct one finished car and one finished ship. Um, there are, in that uh, innocently, decept uh, deceptively uh, simple-looking program, a number of techniques which we regard as artificial intelligence techniques. We have a number of fairly concrete ideas about how some of the crudities uh, should be uh, improved and more intelligent features and considerable shortening of the instruction time introduced. My main thesis is that work in this area is work in an area of science which has an existence in its own right, that artificial intelligence is indeed a subject with its own purposes, its own criteria, and its own professional standards, and it is not to be identified with specific application areas. Well, Sir James, what about the versatile research purpose robot? Is that a mirage? Well, I, I thought that um, in many respects, um, Professor Mickey's uh, film was a good illustration of the description that I'd given of the um, uh, the, the, the robot uh, uh, as a device designed to mimic a certain range of human functions without seeking any useful sphere of human activities to replace human beings, operating in a playpen world with its toy car and its toy ship, and a small universe of discourse and therefore able to solve the logical problems that were involved in, in, in organizing the program. I would certainly agree with Professor Mickey's implication uh, that in certain factory jobs one can create an artificially small enough universe of discourse so that one can think in terms of carrying out this type of logical organization of the task. Um, of course, uh, against that is the fact that um, those who are involved in industrial automation are already doing this uh, uh, by their own methods. It's not the people who work in laboratories called AI laboratories that have a monopoly of thinking how to um, organize uh, tasks uh, on the fact, in factories uh, of, of, of how to carry out uh, these uh, operations in small universes of discourse. Yes. Uh, just a brief interruption, Sir James. Uh, industrial robots are becoming quite common in factories, but they do have one thing in common, and that is that up to the present date, uh, no use of visual sensing has yet been achieved on a practicable scale, and very little tactile sensing. I thought for a moment you were implying that there was not likely to be a chain of beneficial influence between research studies of this kind and the uh, factory robotics of a few years hence. We still have to incorporate, and there are members here of industrial um, automation groups who can confirm it, some of these facilities in, in the industrial environment. But um, there are firms 
that are doing very good visual pattern recognition and analysis by what I would call relatively conventional data processing uh, methods, firms like I Image Analysis Computers Limited. Professor uh, McCarthy, well, one of the things I, I'm finding difficult to, to understand is, is this distinction between advanced automation and what you call artificial intelligence. Can you define for us what this distinction is? What is artificial intelligence? Okay, artificial intelligence is a science uh, namely, it's the study of problem-solving and goal-achieving processes in complex situations. Um, it's a basic science, like mathematics or physics, and has problems distinct from applications and distinct from the study of how uh, human and animal brains uh, work. Um, it requires experiment uh, to carry it out. Now, um, it involves about a very large number of parts to it, of which I will mention precisely four. One of them is the processes of search, uh, which are dealing with a combinatorial explosion. Now, uh, it seemed from what you said that you had uh, just discovered that as a problem, but in fact, the very first work in artificial intelligence, namely Turing's, uh, already treated the problem of combinatorial explosions, and there has been um, a very large part of the work in artificial intelligence, especially game playing, has dealt with that. The next problem is the representation of information internally in the machine, both information about particular situations that the machine has to deal with, uh, the representation of procedures, and the representation of general laws of motion, which determine uh, the future is a function of the past. A third problem is advice giving, how we are going to instruct the computer or communicate with it. At present, programming um, that is uh, influencing a computer program is as though we did education by brain surgery. Uh, now, if you're going to do education to teach a child how to multiply by brain surgery, uh, then you had better have a thorough understanding of how his brain works in detail and be able to get in there and make the desired changes. Uh, this is inconvenient with children and is also um, inconvenient uh, with computer programs. Uh, progress is being made on this. The fourth that I want to mention can be called compiling or now the word used is automatic programming but in an extended sense beyond the way it's used normally in the computer industry and that is going from information uh, that determines how something should be done to a rapid machine procedure for efficiently carrying this out. Uh, this is one of the major topics. Uh, now, I should remark with regard to all of these topics that they can be treated independently of applications or, and independently of how the brain works, and I would be perfectly glad to treat any one of these that you choose. Um, on general purpose robots, I'd like to remark that is in your sense of a, in the strong sense of a general purpose robot, one that would exhibit human quality intelligence, if not, so to speak, quantity, but would be able to deal with a uh, wide variety of situations. The problem, the situation is even in worse shape than you think. Uh, <laughs> namely, even um, the, the general formulation of what the world is like has not been accomplished, so that even if you are prepared to lead the machine by hand through the combinatorial explosion, that is, to tell it which things to do next, uh, you still cannot make it with the present formulations uh, decide how to solve a complex problem. Um, now, uh, this in fact has turned out to be the difficulty not the combinatorial explosion. Uh, the common sense programs have occupied relatively little uh, computer time in the areas in which they were capable of doing, or at least many of them have anyway, uh, but uh, simply have too limited a formulation. Now, uh, part of this is due to a defect in current systems of mathematical logic, where the systems are uh, designed to be reasoned about uh, rather than to be uh, reasoned in. Uh, 